It's not about cooking. And it is about science. Um, it's not traditional <laughs> physics, um, but um, it's, um, it is physics. I'm a physicist. And it's not going to have very many equations. A few, but not very many. Um, lots of physics will be hidden. I don't know somewhere I'm standing where there's um, feedback. The channel knows. Okay. So um, what I'm going to tell you about is really the work of a lot of people who've been through our lab. Um, primarily Anderson Shum, who's now a professor in Hong Kong, uh, Andrew Tata, who's a professor in Scuba, and, and a lot of uh, the later part is Jeremy Agresti, who uh, works for a company in California. And microfluidics, you probably have heard about microfluidics. Um, it's the analog to microelectronics for the fluids world. It's shrinking laboratories down. Uh, the common uh, terminology, in fact, the big journal in the field is lab on a chip. It's taking a whole laboratory and shrinking it onto a single chip. I will tell you a little bit about that at the end of the talk. Um, to be honest, that's where most of our work is now. But I want to actually describe a lot about a different aspect of what we do, and that's how we use microfluidics to make new materials. Now, I'm interested in soft materials, so these are going to be soft materials. But I'll try and convince you that there's some interesting physics to them. Uh, you can understand them fairly simply. You can do things that you can't do otherwise. Um, and you can also um, uh, make things that have practical uh, uh, uses as well. So I'm going to talk about how to make materials. Um, and I'm going to take advantage of really the essence of microfluidics, which are essentially to mix fluids together. Uh, just as you could imagine with microelectronics, you control the way you mix, electron, uh, you mix elect electrons together. You control the way they flow. The same thing with microfluidics. You just control the way they flow. But I'm going to show you that you can control them in such exquisite ways with such exquisite precision that you can make really interesting new kinds of materials. Um, OK, so this is just saying the same thing. Everything I'm going to talk about has to do with drops. So um, let's see. I gave a talk about this yesterday. Actually, it was pouring rain. So you know what drops are. You don't get to see them today. You know drops like that. But you all know what a drop is. A drop is a fluid. A, drop, a raindrop is a drop of a fluid in air. But also, also, you can have a drop of one fluid in a second fluid. And that's what, really what we're going to talk about. And so the advantage of a drop of one fluid in a second fluid, what that does is it essentially encapsulates a fluid in a second fluid. Um, I'll come to some examples. A good one is milk. Uh, milk is white because there's a lot of small, one micron diameter, fat particles, drops of fat in the milk. Milk is homogenized. You mix it really uh, with, with, with a lot of um, uh, energy. Uh, that breaks the fat particles down to one micron. So 2% milk has 2% uh, of these one micron particles. Uh, whole milk has 4%. Heavy cream has 16%. Skim milk has none. That's why it doesn't scatter. It doesn't scatter light as much. It's not as white. But there are some smaller particles that are also the proteins in the milk that, that gives it the white color. So normally drops encapsulate. That's encapsulating fat and water. But Drops have another wonderful property, and that is that there's a surface tension. There's a tension, uh, an energy, to create the interface between the inner fluid and the rest of the fluid. That energy um, creates a tension and keeps, particularly as they get smaller, keeps the shape spherical. And we can use the fact that we can make a very nice sphere not only to encapsulate one thing, but also as a template to build new structures around that. And that's what I want to tell you about today. And so with this, uh, uh, this uh, unique ability, we can build structures and we can make new kinds of functional materials. They're both very interesting, but they really are functional. I'll try and convince you of that. 
And so we can do this, and we can control this because we can use uh, microfluidic devices. So a collection of drops is pouring rain, or it's an emulsion. Milk is an emulsion. Another uh, common emulsion is a salad dressing. Kraft Creamy Italian is a very stable emulsion. If you uh, go to Europe, particularly to France or to Italy, and you have salad dressing, it's usually a mixture of oil and vinegar or vinaigrette. So you mix oil and vinegar. Do oil and vinegar mix? No. How do you mix them? You're shaking your head. Yeah, you. That's how you keep them stable. What do you, how do you mix them? You shake them, right? So here's Anderson. He says, how do you mix them? You shake them. Okay, well, there you go, shaking them. This is what it looks like. There's the drops of one fluid in a second. Notice, though, they're all different sizes. They're different sizes because all you've done is you put this random shear. You've used shear to mix everything up. And so that doesn't give you a lot of control. You get some small drops, some large drops. Here's your scale bar. You can see there are a few tens of microns and below. All different sizes. What I want to tell you about is how to make absolutely uniform drops like this. How can you make drops that are perfectly uniform? So to do that, we invented, you're going to see, as I tell you about this, in my lab, we like to do things really simply. We like to build very, very simple devices so we can focus on the science. So we wanted to invent a new kind of microfluidics that was really easy to work with. And we could work with a lot of different fluids of all different types, different reagents, different fluids. Uh, we could control the wetting. A very, very simple way of doing it. So we invented what we call a new kind of microfluidic device. It's actually a very easy device to make. It's made out of capillary tubes. Capillary tubes, you go to a biology department, a chemistry department, they're very, very common. Uh, you can use you can get them, you can control them. They look like this. These are a picture, just a vial of capillary tubes. These capillary tubes are cylindrical. They're one millimeter in outer diameter, about a half a millimeter in inner diameter. Both the inside and outside wall are absolutely well controlled. They're very well uh, defined. They're uh, perfectly uh, uh, smooth and controlled. They're made out of glass, sometimes quartz, but let's say they're made out of glass. So if they're glass capillary, what you can do is heat the middle until it's very close to the melting temperature of the glass and then pull it. Pull it till it breaks. And you get this very narrow shape here, this point, and there's a small orifice. I'm going to show you a microscope picture. This is taken with a camera. I'm going to show you a microscope picture. This orifice, you start with half a millimeter. It can easily be a micron in diameter. We typically work at a few microns in diameter. You can control the size and the shape very precisely and very reproducibly. In fact, you go to the biology department, they have machines that just control the heating, control the pulling, and you can do it every time exactly the same way. Then we have to align them, and you'll see in a few minutes why we want to align them. We want to make devices, we want to align them very precisely. And to do that, we use um, what, what was inspired by, at least for me, a toy that I had when I was a child. So it was a block of wood, very nice, um, uh, fancy uh, um, machined or carved wood. And it had different holes drilled in it. It had a round hole, a square hole, a triangle hole, a rectangle hole, a rhombohedral hole, all these different shapes. And they had blocks that fit right into the thing. Did anybody have one of those toys? You did, yeah. Remember those? So the triangle only fit in the triangle, right? Couldn't fit in anything else. You had to figure that out, right? The, the circle only fit in the circle, didn't go in the square. But, but, if you had a square where the inner diameter, or inner dimension of the square exactly fit the outer diameter of the circle, it threads very nicely, and you can just butt it up against these two edges, and if it's a cylinder and a square, these align themselves perfectly. So you can take this cylindrical shaped uh, um, capillary tube, and you can buy square capillary tubes, and you can align these things really easily and really simply just by this. 
And then you can flow fluid through the middle here and through these four interstices. But remember, downstream of this middle, it's tapered to a very narrow orifice. So although the area looks very large here, it's actually very small. And so now you can flow two fluids, and you're flowing one fluid into a second. The second fluid is flowing around it. And this turns out to be a very easy way to align these devices. You'll see why I want to align them in a minute. And to adjust the flow and create a, a flow of one fluid into a second. And through that, I can make drops. Here's what it looks like. This is the square capillary. This is the uh, cylindrical capillary tapered to a point. Feed one into the other. You put it together. This is what the device looks like. This was put, uh, built by Anderson. He's a fabulous, fabulous student. He could build a device much more complicated than this. He could build a device like this in about half an hour. Um, and we teach people how to do this very easily. It's held together by our favorite ingredient. Remember, I said I like simple things. Five-minute epoxy, you just glue it all together. It's really simple to create. This is what it looks like when you put it in the lab. You, have, you use a microscope so you can see it. I'll show you pictures of it. Uh, it's connected with uh, various pumps and tubing just to the real world. All very, very simple. And it works really well. So how do you make the drops? Well, this is really the key to everything. It's based on hydrodynamic instabilities. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that. First, here's how you make the drops. Here's a, one of the devices. So this is the cylindrical capillary. It's tapered down to a small orifice. This is about 10 microns in diameter. The drops are about 30 microns in diameter. You can see that they're very, very uniform. Right? They're going but one per second. Actually, they're not one per second. I'm going to show all the movies I show are taken with a high-speed camera and slowed down. These are being made at a few thousand drops per second, and that's a typical number, a few thousand per second. Notice how uniform they are. So I, I asked my students, I said, well, you know, tell me, what's the variation in drop size from drop to drop? And they said, oh, it's a few percent. I said, well, how did you figure that out? I said, well, we just took these images. We took a whole bunch of images, a lot of drops, and we fit them to a circle just to, and, me and measure the variation in the size of the circle. Perfect way of doing that, just do some image analysis. I said, well, that's great, but what's the uncertainty of your image analysis? Well, they said a few percent. Hmm. We can't really measure without doing a lot more sophisticated work. We can't measure the variation in size. They're really perfectly well defined. What does this remind you of? Drip, drip, drip. This is what we call dripping. We call that dripping because if we increase the flow rate of this inner fluid, we form a jet. It still breaks up into drops, but it's a jet. If I hold my laser pointer now as steadily as I can where the drops are formed, you see sometimes they're formed where the laser is, but not always. There's a variation. So jetting still creates drops, but it varies exactly where you see it. You know, I think I forgot to tell you something. This lecture has homework problems. You didn't realize that, did you? You have to go home, and you have to try this for yourself. You can. Go to your kitchen sink and turn it on so it goes very slowly. It'll go drip, drip, drip. That's dripping. Then turn it on just a little bit faster and form a jet. But if you adjust it just right and you look at the bottom of the sink, just before that jet hits the sink, you'll see it breaks up into drops. A cylinder is always unstable to breaking into drops. If you can't do it, if your sink isn't so good, they don't have enough space, you can't adjust the water quite well enough, go outside and take a water hose. Take the water hose that sprays as much water as you can and spray it as far as you can and if you go and look where it starts to, to, to hit the ground you'll see it still breaks up into drops so a cylinder of fluid is always susceptible to breaking into drops and that's the Rayleigh plateau instability so let's understand these two conditions so dripping actually this is really easy to understand dripping what happens is you form you're, you're, you're forming the drop very slowly so initially, it's held in place by the forces of surface tension of the water against the faucet. It's just, it's sufficient. It's greater than the weight of the drop. As the drop grows, its weight increases, its weight increases, 
increases. And finally, the weight of the drop is exactly equal to the force of surface tension. And when that happens, it breaks off and it falls. Because you're just balancing these two forces, if you have a clean faucet, everything's the same, the drop is always exactly the same size. What about a cylinder? A cylinder you can understand very easily. A cylinder of fluid is always susceptible, always susceptible to breaking into two spheres. And again, it's just surface tension that's doing it because you want to minimize the total surface energy and you want to therefore minimize the, uh, the surface to volume uh, ratio and, a, and two spheres have, have a lower surface to volume ratio than the cylinder. And we can understand the physics of this very easily. Remember, there's a surface tension. What that means is a, there's a Laplace pressure. There's actually an increased pressure inside that depends on the surface tension and inversely on the radius. So if I have a cylinder, there's a Laplace pressure that depends inversely on the radius. If I have a small fluctuation, a small indentation, then the pressure here is larger than the pressure here or the pressure here. So any small fluctuation is going to grow because it's going to drive the fluid in this direction and in this direction because the pressure is higher here. So it's susceptible for any fluctuation. And we can calculate the growth of that. It's just uh, determined by the driving forces of the surface tension and the resistance, the thing that slows it down, is the viscosity of the fluid. So the velocity of this growth in this direction is given by the surface tension divided by the viscosity. And so, of course, the time scale for the snap-off is just that velocity and the size, which is the radius of the drop. That gives me the time that it takes to snap off due to this Rayleigh plateau instability, how long it takes for this to snap off like that. Then if I have a traveling uh, cylinder, which I do because I'm forming a jet, if I have a traveling cylinder, while it's snapping off, it's moving downstream. And how long is the jet? Well, I calculated the snap-off time, and I know the velocity of the interface in this direction, so I can just calculate the length of just the velocity times the time, and that gives me the length. And now it's very easy to calculate where do I see the transition between a jet and a drip and a draw and dripping. It's just where the length of this jet is essentially the diameter of the uh, of the uh, cylinder of the of the sphere, and so that happens. I just set this equal to the radius, and I find that it's when this dimensionless number, the capillary number, which is the velocity in this direction times the viscosity divided by the surface tension. This is a dimensionless number. This is the capillary number. When that's of order one, that's the transition between dripping and jetting. And it's really, this physics is very simple. I have a certain time it takes to snap off like this, and I just want to fill the, fill the drop to the size that it is so it's equal to that snap off time. Actually, there's another kind of instability that occurs here where if you look carefully, I put some small particles in the inner fluid, and you can see they're flowing very, very rapidly. So in this case, the inner fluid is flowing so rapidly that inertial effects are important. So here what happens is it flows rapidly, and if you watch, watch here in particular, you can see this, you see it start to oscillate, you see these flowing oscillations? If I measure this, oops, sorry. If I measure this, you see it's all the hallmarks of a growing instability. This is a stationary instability because it doesn't move downstream very much while you get these oscillations, these growing oscillations that cause the snap off. This depends on the inertial effects, so it's a balance between inertia and surface tension. It's just another dimensionless number, the Weber number. And actually, you can put all of this together and there's a dimensionless number, a quantity, the, the sum of the Weber and the capillary numbers. When that equals 1, that's here, that's the border between the dripping and the jetting. And so we can understand whether we get dripping or jetting on all these different conditions just by these simple hydrodynamic instabilities. Well, Andy Utada came along. He was another really excellent graduate student. We called him Handy Andy. He really was handy. He could really work with his hands. He built these devices very well. 
Actually, we called him Handy because we sent him to uh, to visit France, where, where some of my friends wanted to learn how to make the devices. So we sent Andy over to show him. And in France, they don't say Andy; they say Andy. And we realized he really was Handy. So we called him Handy Andy, and he was really a wonderful graduate student, really fabulous. And like all really great graduate students, he made mistakes. So he made a mistake. We told him, go and connect this all together. He made a mistake. He connected it wrong. But we learned a lot from it. So rather than connecting it in this geometry that I showed, well, let me show it here. This geometry here, which we call the co-flow geometry, where it's flowing in the same direction, he connected the inner fluid in the opposite direction and collected everything through these, this orifice. So now the inner fluid comes from this side, the outer fluid comes from the other side, and he forces everything through this orifice. That works just as well. We call this flow focusing because this outer fluid is hydrodynamically focusing the inner fluid through this orifice. This actually works even better because the stream here is even thinner than the orifice because you have to get both fluids to flow through the same orifice. But it works just fine. Here's an example. Here we're getting, the, we're in the dripping mode. You see the drops form. So this inner fluid is coming from over here, but the outer fluid is coming from the other side and it's looping around like this. So this is dripping. We can form a jet. You can't really see uh, the uh, collection tube here because the index of refraction is exactly the same as the outer fluid, but there's a little piece of dust to show you where it is. But you can form them just as well. But what's really interesting is we have this um, flow focusing geometry, but look, remember I told you we can align things really well. We have a lot of space here. Let's just put another capillary tube. Now we have a flow focusing but not of a single fluid, but a coaxial flow of two fluids. So now we're flow, we have three fluids, uh, surrounding fluid from the innermost fluid, all in this outermost fluid. It works, it's very easy to assemble. So here's our square capillary. The, cylinder, the first cylindrical capillary goes here. The second one goes threaded in the same way. It looks like this in the microscope. It's really easy to align these things. That's the beauty of being able to align this. You can put it all together, and you can build a device. This is one of Anderson's devices. He built it again in about half an hour. You can see now there's forming drops, but all the drops uh, have an inner drop and an outer drop. Maybe it's better if I show you this image, where just by changing the flow rates, you can get drops of different size. So here's a small drop inside of a large drop. Here's an intermediate drop inside of a larger drop. These drops are almost the same size, and this is a little bit smaller. You might think that there's only a single drop here, but if you look, there's one fluid, two fluids, and three fluids. So now you're making these interesting structures. You're making what I call a double emulsion, a drop inside of a drop, or a core shell structure. And just by changing the flow rates, you can change the thickness of the shell or the size of the drops. You can make this, and these, in these fact, these structures are often used, these double emulsions. And you can make them a uh, traditional way. The way you make them traditionally is you emulsify one, and then you take that and you emulsify it. And this is an example of that. And notice that in this case, I've taken something with a, uh, I've, I've made the innermost fluid fluorescent. Some of the drops have nothing. Other drops have two drops on the inside. Here's one that just has one. You get this random mixture because just by shaking, you get a large polydispersity. If I do it twice, I get a polydispersity squared. It really leads to a very random uh, inhomogeneous distribution. By doing it with these microfluidic devices, you have perfect control. Now, already this is very useful. Let me give you a simple example of what we can do with this. Imagine I take a structure like this. This is the outermost fluid I'll use is water, and the innermost fluid I'll use water. As the shell structure, I'll use a, some kind of solvent. But in that solvent, I'll put some molecules that are amphiphilic, that can't decide whether they want to be in the oil, which is in the shell, or in the water, which is in the inside or the outside. These are surfactant molecules. They have half of them are water-liking and half of them are oil-liking. And so where do they sit? 
they sit at the interface. And I can use a surfactant, or I can use a phospholipid. That's the surfactant that's made up, that makes up the, the cell membranes in our bodies. Or I can use a dye block copolymer, a polymer that has an amphiphilic polymer that's half hydrophobic and half hydrophilic. Whatever, whichever one I do, if I put them in the solvent here, they'll go and they'll coat this interface and they'll coat this interface. But imagine if I make this solvent volatile, then I can evaporate it. And then I can get rid of the solvent. What am I left with? I'm left with a bilayer structure of a layer of surfactant-like molecules on the inside and surfactant-like molecules on the outside. If I use phospholipids, then the structure I have is a vesicle or a liposome. Those are natural structures that encapsulate things in cells, but are also very useful for encapsulating drugs and for delivering drugs. Now, the problem with that is the way you normally make them is you put a multilayer. You just dry these phospholipids on the surface. You put a multilayer of, of uh, phospholipids on the surface. You put water and the drug on top, and you bubble nitrogen on top, and that they self-assemble. They fold up and they form these bags, these liposomes, or these vesicle structures, and they self-assemble into them. It's a great way, and it's commonly used for encapsulating things for drug delivery. The problem is that I've encapsulated what's inside, but there's drug everywhere. And this is very valuable. The drug's very valuable. So I have to try and recover all the drug from everything else, separate them out, and do this over and over. It's very difficult to efficiently encapsulate things. But in this fashion, this fluid and this fluid come from two completely different streams. So I can encapsulate things very easily. So this is a very nice way of encapsulating things. It works quite well. Here I've made them out of polymers. So these are polymerosomes. These are apophilic polymers. These particular polymers are completely biocompatible. Uh, They're completely safe to use uh, um, for uh, biological uses. You can see these are the structures uh, viewed with the microscope. First of all, they're very uniform in size. They all have a little ball of excess polymer. The reason they do that is you want to make sure you completely cover the interface so you put enough polymer inside the solvent that you cover the interface and have a little excess. And that's what you see here. And these particular ones, these very ones, we filled with a fluorescent dye. This is bright field. This is a fluorescent image. And this dye, if you come back several months later, it's perfectly well encapsulated. It's very easy to encapsulate. Actually, it's interesting to watch what happens as you evaporate the solvent. Here's a, some images as the solvent evaporates. So this is actually the solvent. If you look here, you can see this is the solvent, and this is the bilayer structure. Notice that there's a well-defined angle here. There's a contact angle here. That immediately tells you that, in fact, these two bilayers, these two layers, have to be adhesive. Unless you have an adhesive energy, you can't have a well-defined contact angle. This eventually will evaporate, leaving this shell here. And you can measure, in fact, you can measure the stability of the uh, structures as a function of the contact angle. We can change the contact angle by mixing different solvents, and you find that the best structures occur when the contact angle is 90 degrees, which is the largest it can be. That means they're the most adhesive. Now, if there's an adhesion between these two layers, what that means is the, the, the shell itself must be slightly elastic. So how can I prove that to you? Well, I can prove it to you by crushing the cell. So how do I, take, how do I crush the cell? Well, one way of doing it is taking a hammer, right, and going like this. Well, that's not the right way of doing it. I have to put a pressure on it. But I don't want to put a hydrostatic pressure. I don't want to press on everything. I want to just press on the shell. So I do that by putting on osmotic pressure. Basically, I put something on the outside that sucks water out, puts an osmotic pressure on this. If I do that, look what happens. Here I'm putting osmotic. See what happens? It gets crushed. But how does it get crushed? It buckles. 
it can only buckle if it's a solid. So the fact that it buckles immediately tells me that it's an elastic shell. In fact, uh, Sujit Dada, a uh, graduate student, worked with uh, David Nelson, a theorist in my, uh, in my department, a collaborator, and they measured the number of uh, shells that got crushed as a function of the pressure that they put on them. And by fitting this, they could measure the elastic constant of the shell. Notice, by the way, that the pressure is fairly large. It's many atmospheres in pressure. So it's a megapascals of pressure. Um, actually, watching these things crush, if I now continue crushing them, you see I buckle them, but if I continue crushing them, I can just crush them completely. I can drive everything out on the inside. So if I do this, I'm crushing them. I'm squeezing everything out. Everything except the very, very largest molecules will be squeezed out. So what have I just shown you? I've shown you, okay, this is a nice elastic shell, but I've also shown you a way of getting stuff out. I've shown you how to um, encapsulate things. I've also shown you how to release things. I just crush it with a pressure on the outside. Actually, there's another way of doing it. Rather than crushing it, I can explode it. I can put it in an environment where the pressure on the outside is very low, and the pressure on the inside, the molecules on the inside, have their own osmotic pressure. So if I put it in pure water, and the pressure on the outside is very low, the pressure on the inside blows them up. And this is what I've done here. I put this in pure water, and this is the, uh, the, that same fluorescent dye. Here you can see a little hole. This is after we put it in pure water. I would show you a fluorescent image, but you wouldn't see anything. I have to show you a bright field image. Sort of interesting to watch. Here's a case where I put these uh, uh, polymerosomes in pure water. And watch what happens to this one. See, it gets larger. Water is rushing in because it's trying to blow itself up, and then boom, a little hole develops, and the water rushes out. This one here grows up, and then it collapses, and it com completely collapses. So here's just another way of releasing what's inside. Rather than crushing them, I can blow them up, just controlling osmotic pressure. Well. I don't have to evaporate the solvent. I could polymerize it. Here's a case where we take where we use as the solvent for the shell, we use a UV curable resin. We cured it with a UV. And in order to break these, these are now really solid. To break these, we had to squeeze them between two glass plates, as shown here. We can also make liquid crystal. This is a case where we uh, took uh, a liquid, a pneumatic liquid crystal. We diluted it in chloroform to make an isotropic liquid, and then we started to evaporate the uh, chloroform to form a liquid crystal. This is a pneumatic liquid crystal. We're looking at it through cross polars. You can start seeing the liquid crystal to form. We did this because uh, my colleague David Nelson, again, came and challenged uh, Alberto um, to uh, look at these structures. He said they should look like baseballs. This was, of course, one, uh, one of the years that the Red Sox were winning the World Series. He was very interested in this. He said there should be a, a defect structure that looked like baseballs, and you, he had some ideas of, of using it. Could Alberto do it? So Alberto made a thin shell, and sure enough, you see these four defects. These are these four de defects, but rather being, than being symmetrically located, they're located all on the top because there's a difference in buoyancy. There was a, a little uh, gravitational effect, and so the thickness of the shell changed. But when Alberto looked more closely, he sometimes found only two, and he sometimes found three. And so we had a lot of fun going back and forth with David to figure out what are all these defect structures with thin shells of, um, uh, of, of pneumatics. And actually, it turns out that the thickness of the shell plays a big role in the structures that you get. Here's another thing we did where we used um, a, um, a wax. This wax melts at some reasonable temperature. I don't know. It's around 50 degrees. So if we uh, make the uh, emulsions at, or these core shell structures at a somewhat higher temperature, they're fluid, then we cool them down and they're a solid. This creates a nice way of, uh, of having something that, again, we can control the release by temperature. So here's a shell. And I just show you what happens. These have, uh, this has dye. This has colloidal particles. I heat them up and it melts and it releases. We did this because we're 
challenge to make uh, a way of, uh, of encapsulating um, material for laundry detergent. In fact, you want, we were trying to encapsulate some starch, but just to show that you can encapsulate something, we encapsulated the detergent. So here is water and oil with some detergent. If you mix the detergent and mix them up, it emulsifies. That's the way you clean things. If you do the same thing with where you have the detergent in these, uh, in these capsules, you can still separate the water from the oil, but if you heat it up, you can't. So it's a good way of encapsulating things. So Liang Yin Chu came and visited us from Sichuan University. He worked with Andy, and Andy showed him how to make these devices. Liang Yin said, I want to make something slightly different. So he made a different device. He made a device that has a co-flow and into a second co-flow. So here you see the drops going in here. And I've watched this movie, so I know there's two. One more is going to come along, has three. And then it's going to snap off, and this repeats itself. Now you have really very good control. And so now you can make what I call designer emulsions. You can make any number of drops that you want. And so I say, well, how many drops do you want on the inside? You say five. Well, I say, well, what size do you want? See, here's five. I can change both the number and the size very easily. But, okay, this is nice, but then Liang Yin said, I, uh, I told Yang, we had to do something a little bit different. Look, there's one emulsion generator, two emulsion generators. What about adding a third? So he did. <laughs> now you can make Russian dolls, right? <laughs> drops inside of drops inside of drops. And Liang Yin went home and he made an even more complicated thing. He could make different types of materials. So these are great, but really, you look at these and say, who would ever do something like this? Must be some stupid academic doing something like this, right? What use could they possibly be? Well, I told Liang, we better do something that is useful. So we made the structure that looks like this. This is a water and oil emulsion. But in these water drops, we put some very, very delicate peptides. These are very, very useful for treating skin, for treating your skin. This is in an oil emulsion with lots of surfactant. The surfactant would uh, denature those peptides and render them completely useless. But we built, using these, these structures, we built a hydrogel around this. This hydrogel perfectly encapsulates this inner emulsion. It's just perfect. But this particular hydrogel is thermosensitive. As you heat it up, it shrinks. It tries to shrink. It tries to collapse on the inner fluid, but this inner fluid is incompressible. So look what happens. It tries to collapse. It drives the water out of the hydrogel. It can't collapse, so it tears itself apart and it releases it. So what have I just showed you? I've showed you something that absolutely uh, encapsulates perfectly, but controllably releases it. And it turns out if you think about or if you study encapsulation and release, it's very easy to make something that is a very robust encapsulant, but it's very hard to make it release. It's also very easy to make something releases very easily, but then it's not a very good encapsulant. To make something that both encapsulates and releases is much more difficult. But because we can control the fluid so well, we can really make things now where we can do both. So this really does become something useful. Um, OK, a couple of other things. Uh, this is Xin Yun came and he made a slightly different event. I'm getting, it's getting late. I won't go through the details. It's a nice way of making a very thin shell. Uh, Laura Ariaga uses this to make really nice uh, vesicles. They're shown here. You can see the thermal fluctuation. These are bilayer structures of phospholipids. Here's the solvent that's just evaporating. It's just evaporating. A very nice control way. I'm going to skip this to move ahead uh, to just uh, uh, go a little bit further along. You know, the nice thing about this is you really can make beautiful structures. The problem is you're making them one at a time. That's the beauty of this. That's why you can make them so controllable. And so the pro you might ask, well, can you really do something practical with this? And remember I told you your homework problem? Calculate if you make one drop of uh, milk, if a milk has 4% of one micron drops, how many drops are there in a liter of milk? It's a lot. Make one at a time. You see, it's pretty tough to make that. So, in fact, around the time we first started doing this, 
my very good friend and colleague, Howard Stone, he, he since left Harvard, uh, a big uh, home personal care company says, we, we make emulsions. He went to Harvard to Howard and said, can you show us whether we can do this on a commercial scale? And they worked for about three years, and they decided they couldn't. And when I heard that, and they just closed the whole project. When I heard that, I said, well, that's a perfect problem for Harvard students. That's something we really ought to be able to solve. The question is, can we scale it up? So, um, well, how do you do that? Remember I told you Anderson, really a fabulous student, really a great student. He makes a device in half an hour. So I said, Anderson, you know, we want to see, can we scale this up? Why don't you make two devices, and let's see if the, uh, if the uh, emulsions that you make are the same. So we went away, an hour later, he came back, two a half hour each, came back, two devices, and we looked, and we couldn't tell the difference between which device the drops came from. They were just perfect. I said, okay, Anderson, that's pretty easy. Make 10 devices, let's test that. So he looked at me, strange look, came back the next day, right, 10 devices, half an hour each, five hours, time to eat, time to sleep, get everything together. But we tested them, and again, we couldn't tell whether they come from device five or seven. You couldn't tell the difference. So that's, I told the Anderson, that's great. You can really do this, but now I need 10,000 devices so we can make enough material. <laughs> so he looked at me, and he smiled, and he got up and he walked out of my office. He had better things to do. He graduated. That's not the way to scale it. So what do you do? Well, if you work at Harvard, you go, you get up, you go across the street, you say, George, Dr. George Whiteside, George, please show us how to make things with soft lithography. Use the more traditional route for uh, microfluidic devices. And I won't go through the details. The important thing is to make one device, you very carefully design it with a CAD program into a mask, and you expose things with UV into a photoresist to make your, your, your device. Then if you want two devices, you've very carefully made one. Two devices is called copy-paste. Four devices, copy-paste, copy-paste. Eight devices, copy well, You can see the scaling is very different. So this is the way to do it if you really want to scale. So we had to learn a lot. I won't go through all the details of what we had to learn. Here's a, a device where we make a double emulsion. This is the Liang Yin type of geometry. One emulsion generate two. You can see we can make different numbers easily. We can make three emulsions, just stack them together. Three emulsions, you see them. It's interesting because you only get one drop at a time, so there's some interesting physics here, which I don't have time to describe. But the postdoc who was doing this, Adam Abadi, said, well, uh, Langan already made three emulsions, uh, triple emulsions. I'm going to do something much better. I'll make quint uh, quintuple emulsions. Drops instead of drops instead of drops instead of drops instead of drops. It's easy. You just stack them up. It works perfectly. Of course, that's not the stacking you really want. You want to stack them in three dimensions. You want to stack them in parallel. So Mark Romanowski came along. He told me, he said, I've been here as a graduate student. It's a different group. I've been a graduate student in Harvard for four years. I have no results. Do you have any projects for me? So what do you work on? He told me, I didn't tell him this, but I said, you know, even if you had results, who would care? So I asked, what do you do? And it turns out he learned how, knew how to work in the clean room. I said, okay, I'm going to give you a challenge. Here's my challenge. I give you a liter of material. Liter is 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. I give you three pumps. I want you to process a liter of material an hour. So imagine I'm going to have something that's this big. I'm going to process a liter of material an hour. Well, if I want to do the right scaling, I get to fill this room with those things if they're not too expensive. And then I can ask how much material I can process. This starts becoming interesting. I said, if you do this, first of all, you'll do something that's really interesting. You write a good paper. He did. The paper he wrote was the most downloaded paper of the month in the journal he published it. I said, the other thing is, you'll graduate. A year and a half later, he graduated. So I won't go through the details, but this is a movie showing this, this device has 25 emulsion generators. You can see it makes a lot of material. Actually, Esther Amstead came a little later, and she really wanted to make a lot of material. So she made what she called a millipede device. This has a thousand emulsion generators up and down both sides. Each of these challenge, channels is an emulsion generator. That's what it looks like. So now you can see it really makes a lot of material. In fact, I don't have the time, but there's a completely new hydrodynamic instability 
that controls these things. So all the uh, emulsion generators produce exactly the same size drop independent of the flow rate because of the hydrodynamic instability of these things. But what's interesting, you can see they make very uniform devices. So what's interesting, let's just put the numbers in. Before she left, she's done better since she's left. She's a professor at EPFL now. Before she left, she made one device that would create 25 milliliters per hour of internal phase. This particular device had dimensions of four by one by a half centimeter. So I'm not going to try and fit them in or do anything fancy. I'm just going to ask, how much material can I make with a liter of these devices? So in a liter, I can fit 400 devices. So now I'm making 10 liters per liter per hour. And that's the right number. So now I think we really can scale things. But if I really want to prove this, if I want to prove this uh, statement that this company came to, to Howard, can you do it on a commercial scale? I should just do something commercial. Well, it's still pretty expensive, so I have to find something with high value added. So what's the highest value added thing that you can use these drops for? Well, obviously, it's drug delivery. The trouble with that is to get something cleared through the FDA takes about seven years. I didn't want to wait seven years to prove that you could do it commercially. So what's the next highest value added thing that's made out of emulsion? Anybody know? Cosmetics. Some people use it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Grease, yeah, can cream. So we started a company. We called it Capsum. We put it in Paris, the Silicon Valley of cosmetics. And we learned how to make cosmetics. In fact, we were challenged by a former postdoc who went back and he worked for Amori Pacific, the largest cosmetic company in Korea, and we made these polymerosomes and they commercialized it in this. And Capsum has gone on to make all kinds of things. This is a new kind of emulsion. I won't go through the details about this, but it's a totally new type of emulsion. You can only make it because you're doing this with these microfluidic devices. And this makes this material. This is sold by Chanel. And I I uh, encourage you to actually go and look at the website of this material because I have a beautiful movie showing that this is made with microfluid devices. And in the first nine months, they sold a million units of this. And that shows you really can commercialize. This is material that's made with microfluidics. It's, uh, the, the device that makes it about this big, this big, it worked about um, maybe one shift a day for part of the time, and it produces so now you really can produce large quantities of material. OK, I'm going to spend about two or three minutes more just telling you the other half of what you can do with microfluidics. Again, emphasizing drops. And that's the lab on the chip side. Let me show you why this is sort of interesting. If you want to do a lot of experiments these days, and in biology, you often want to do a lot of experiments, what you do is you get a machine that has a robot that has a bunch of pipettes, and you use what's called a micro titer plate. You use this plate. This has 384 wells. Each of these wells typically has between 10 and 100 microliters inside. And each of these wells, you do chemical reactions. You mix and match and do chemical reactions. These. If you have a robot, you can do a lot of these things. What we do is we replace each of these wells by one of these drops. And the most important difference is that this might use 10 microliters if you really try and keep it small. These drops have a volume of a picoliter. The difference between 10 microliters and a picoliter is seven orders of magnitude. So you can do experiments with using seven orders of magnitude less volume. Why is that interesting? Well, let me give you an example. This is really a back of the envelope calculation, but this is absolutely real. If you go to a drug company, a big drug company, they'll have been making drugs for many, many years. And every time they make a drug, they save it. They save a certain amount of it. They might have a library of 100,000 compounds. If you discover some new biomarker, you might just ask, well, if I want to treat the, that particular disease, since I know how to treat it now, one way of, of, rather than developing a new drug, one way to get a lead is just look and see whether any of the drugs I've got actually work. And so they've, they, they've built these large screening systems with using these robots where they're screening. So they might just want to screen binding, for example, just to see do they have something that will bind to what they want to, want to treat. So they might use 10 concentrations to find the binding constant. So then you're doing a million experiments. You can do that with these robots, and this is really common. 
the trouble is, even if you use 10 microliters per test, but you do a million experiments, you're using 10 liters of reagent. And those reagents are very expensive. And what limits you is the cost of the reagents. And I once did a calculation. I said, I have eight uh, pipettes in parallel. I have to do this three times. I want to do a million experiments. I estimated that you have to run that robot for four months, 24-7. And you better hope that it doesn't break during that time. If you do it with microfluidics, if you do it with a picoliter, and you do a million experiments with a picoliter, you use a total of one microliter reagent. One microliter is less than one experiment. You do it a thousand per second, you do the whole experiment in 20 minutes, and it's done. Go out, have a cup of coffee, come back, and it's done. If you want to do this, so this is very powerful. If you want to do this, you better be able to control the same way that you mix and match things. And that's what we've worked for years to perfect. So let me just start this more carefully. So we make drops here. We learn how to break drops into two so we can do two experiments on them, two different sizes. We can break them many times. These are just different devices that we've made over the years. We can combine them. This turns out to be a very difficult thing to combine them. You need to do this because you have reaction A, react, reactant A, reactant B. You want to start a reaction. Remember, these are water drops, mainly going to use biology, water drops in oil. Water has a high dielectric constant. Oil has a low dielectric constant. You put an electric field across something with a high dielectric constant. You induce a dipole. You have two drops, two dipoles, same direction. They attract. They coalesce. Another way of mixing, this is what we call a pico injector. Again, an electric field breaks the interface between an injecting fluid and the drops. Every drop that comes by, get, comes by this one gets lit, literally a pico, pico liter of fluid injected into it. This is controlled by electric field, so we can have a whole series of injectors, and only this one is turned on. We can now mix and match on a drop-by-drop -drop basis, as many, of, as many as we want. We can detect, we use optical detection. If you really want to do something, uh, if you want to screen something, you should be able to choose things. So we built this very sophisticated device. This is a sorter. This has a little laser detector. And now we're inducing an electric field. If we want to put a force on it, the electric field will induce a dipole. We want to put a force on the dipole. We need a gradient of electric field. So here we use a gradient of electric field. And we can pull any drop out. We can pull one drop out in 5,000 per second. So here's a very simple experiment just to demonstrate what we can do. Horseradish peroxidase, HRP, is a commonly used biological marker. It's something that says you have something there, you create this. The reason it's used, it's an enzyme, and it works on a substrate. You add a substrate to it, and it turns that, it works on, it does a catalytic reaction and makes a fluorescent dye. So it makes something that fluoresces. Nature has done, that, has made this very well. We asked a simple question, could we improve on it? So how do we improve on it? Well, nature has done it very well. We can use exactly the same way nature does. We can take the gene that codes for this enzyme, we could put mutations in the gene, and we can evolve it to find something that works better. So how do we do this? Well, we start with the parental gene, we reproduce it, we, we amplify it, we reproduce it, but we put lots of errors in, we put lots of mutations. And we make a library of mutated genes. And then we just ask, do any of these things work as well or better? To do that, we, this was done several years ago. We didn't know as much how to do it in drops. So we, we do this by using a trick with uh, Dane Witter at MIT. He takes the gene, he puts it in yeast, and he tricks the yeast to, to express the gene on the surface. So the enzyme is expressed on the surface. And so every time, every time there's a drop, there's a yeast cell in here. And you can see it turns, we add the substrate, it turns, it, it makes it fluoresce. So now the experiment is very simple. We take a library of mutated genes, we put one gene per, uh, per yeast cell in a yeast cell, one yeast cell per drop, we add the substrate, and we just ask, does it fluoresce? If it fluoresces, we sort it out. The nice thing is that we can grow them up, we can break the emulsion of the ones that we've sorted, grow it up and sort again and again, so we really improve the sorting. So we do this. If we, if we take the wild type, this is the average level of fluorescence. At first, most of the mutants don't uh, create anything that fluoresces. So the level, the average level goes down. After a few sorts, it goes up a bit. And we look and we see that 
we have a bunch of genes, a bunch of uh, 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 enzymes that work roughly as well as the parent type. What we did was we started with a library of 10 to the 7, and we found roughly 100 mutants that worked as well. 10 to the 7, we found 100. Then what we did is we took the best of those and we did a second round of mutation. And then we immediately found something that worked a lot better. So what are we doing? We can understand this with this fitness diagram. As physicists, this is exactly the upside-down version of energy landscape. It's a fitness landscape. Energy landscapes change the state, go down to the lowest energy. Fitness, uh, fitness you want to go to the highest. You go to the peak. So nature has made this work very well. It's at its peak. And we want to change. This is mutation space. We want to jump to another peak. Most mutations take us to Big Valley, into the water. We want to find something what we did here. What we did was we did a neutral selection. We first found things that worked roughly as well. Now, in this case, we found about 1 in 10 to the, uh, and one in 10 to the 5. You can do this in the past, but I always, uh, before, before you did this, you always did this by hand. I mean, people have done um, directed evolution, you did it by hand. And so I always ask, well, what's a quantum of how many, how many experiments I can do? A quantum of experiments I can do is how many experiments one student can do in a graduate student lifetime. It's about 1,000. I estimate 1,000. If you do 1,000 experiments, you're not going to be able to search on the library to find reliably something in 10 to the minus 5. You have to do it this way. And when you do it this way, you find, okay, you do it once, then the second time you do it really well. Actually, you could do it with a robot. Let me show you why you wouldn't. If you did it with a robot, you'd use about 5,000 liters to the screen. We use about 150 microliters. It would take you about two years to do the screen. For us, the screening took about seven hours. It would cost $16 million to do the screen. For us, we, we sort of tried to amortize it. We figured it cost about $2.50. In fact, I showed this to my colleague, my friend David Nelson, a the theorist. And you know what he told me? He said, you're amazing. You really don't pay your students very much. They worked for seven hours. And you only paid them $2.50. <laughs> so I assured him that, no, this didn't include the uh, labor costs. And in fact, it would even be better if we did. Anyways, this is really the kind of thing, just hinting at the power you have now with this lab on a chip um, um, applications of, uh, of drops uh, in microfluidic devices. And I would say about 60% of the people in my lab now are applying it to various kinds of biotechnology problems, which I would love to tell you, tell you about, but I don't have time. So let me stop and take a few questions, and thank you for your attention. Sure, sure. Um, you know, we've been trying to build proto cells for a long time. Um, so to be honest, you can build a lot of the structure of the cell, but to build the whole cell maybe is a little difficult. Can you reproduce life? That's the real challenge. It's worth trying. Well, okay, so you're asking a lot of questions. Do we use ultrasound? The answer is absolutely. Uh, we can make drops that way. We, um, we've developed a way of sorting. I showed you with these, uh, dial, uh, these uh, dielectrophoretic sorters. We've developed a way of using a surface acoustic wave to build a sorter. We've developed ways of uh, merging drops with uh, acoustic waves. Um, if you're thinking about delivery and uh, bursting things in the body with ultrasound, we have done things like that. We don't do so much like that. Um, for that, actually, it's better to make uh, drops of air, bubbles of air, 
we've made very stable bubbles of air this way. Um, that it turns out that air is a very good absorber of ultrasound, and you can burst things very nicely and deliver things. So yeah, we use ultrasound a lot. So um, let's see, what can I tell you? I can tell you a lot. Um, let me tell you a few things. We started a company maybe 10 years ago where the first thing we were going to make was a personal laboratory system. It was going to do everything. But that's because we didn't know exactly what to do. And that company lasted for about uh, eight years. And it was recently acquired by another company. Uh, it decided what to do. It did digital PCR. It did. Um, um, amplification for sequencing. It was acquired for another by, by a much larger company for almost nothing because basically it failed. But now if you look at the state of the art of um, microfluidic technology and uh, commercialization, the companies that were successful in the early days that used valves to move fluids around to control fluids, those companies are all failing now because that's just too complicated. Drops are now really starting to take over. So now there's a lot of companies that are starting all sorts of things that use drops. And we, you know, now it's getting to the point in my lab where we're maybe two or three companies a year are coming out of the lab just because there's so many things that we no longer can do in our lab. They have to be pushed out to, to commercialize. So I think that there's really tremendous potential. You're right that... Um, you have to be careful about the IP. And you have to, it's a very murky thing. A lot of the, uh, the devices that I showed you, the techniques that I showed you, like the Pico injector, was actually invented because we couldn't use something else that we invented because it was licensed exclusively to one company. And we wanted to do it ultimately for a commercial purpose. We had to find a new way of doing it. So we're always inventing new ways of, to do things just to make sure that we uh, can get it out and be innovative about what we do. So I think there's tremendous potential. Uh, the answer is proven to be an issue, but it's generally solved. Um, so I'll give you just a couple of examples. Um, the, there's a, uh, a thought that um, when cancer metastasizes, cells must run through the blood. Um, and uh, so the, there's a, a technology called liquid biopsy, where you look in the blood for the cancer cells. So you look for circulating tumor cells. Um, they exist roughly at uh, one per mil. In a mil, you have 10 to the 9 cells. And so some colleagues of mine at the cancer center, microfluid cancer center, built some beautiful devices, as other people have, that enrich those cells. And we take those cells now, put those the enriched cells, we put them in the drops, and we're able to detect these things very, very sensitively. Uh, we have other uh, ways where we now are uh, using 
these kind of techniques, uh, you know, I haven't described the details, to look for pathogens. Uh, if you want to detect sepsis, you have to detect one bacterium per mill of blood. We are now down to two bacteria per mill of blood. Very, very sensitive ways of doing it. Uh, we'll get down to one eventually. Um, so I think that, you know, there, there's added steps you have to do to uh, concentrate. You can't work with the mill. You have to work with uh, 50 microliters. But there, there's a lot of technologies now that do the same thing. So you're absolutely right that it's the connection between the real world and the microfluidic world, you have to worry about it. But I think that's being solved. Um, I would say no, um, and the reason is, um, well, we're not doing it. Um, uh, I think that for nanostructured materials, first of all, there are probably better ways of creating nanostructured materials. Unless you want a very sophisticated kind of structure, then you probably could do it this way. Um, we tend not to like to work at nanos a nanometer scale. There's nothing about the physics I showed you that prevents you from working down to, say, 20 or 30 nanometers. Um, the real thing that, that does prevent you is dust is 5 microns. And so if you want to work, if you want to just make direct drops that are nanometers, you have to work in a clean room, filter. And I told you we're lazy, right? We do things simply. We don't like to do that. So we, we, we don't do that. We've made nanoparticles with a totally different technology that I didn't describe uh, using a different kind of microfluidic device. Um, lots of interesting physics there. But um, generally speaking, um, the kind of technologies that I showed you are not exactly the kind of technologies for making nanometer scale particles. There are other technologies which I didn't describe which are more suitable. Well, let me give you an answer, two answers to this. First of all, what is the role of makeup? <laughs> you know, you're right, except girls already look pretty. <laughs> really, really. So you're almost there. What is the role? Exactly. To make girls feel better. To make anybody feel better. So what makes you feel better? Well, a very important thing is how it feels on the skin. Okay, so the particular um, serum that we made for Chanel is really unique. It's, uh, the drops are about 100 microns in diameter, so the amount of surface is relatively small, and they're made by coacervation. They're made with a thin elastic shell, no surfactant. Surfactant is actually not a good thing for um, a, a cream because it dries out the skin. So here, this is a moisturizer with no surfactant in water. You put it on your skin, and it's like putting water on your skin. It feels very, just very moist, watery. And right when it starts to dry, it bursts. And you can feel it burst because you break the drops, and you get the moisturizing effect right at the end. So it has a completely different feel than anything you've ever used. <laughs> and that was... That was, I mean, you, even I can feel that, right? You can really feel it. And you can't do that any other way. That's why that was the, th that product, that one product, was the one thing that made uh, Chanel's sales increase the year it was introduced by a lot. That was the only thing that really had huge growth in, in makeup. So, yes, you can make things that really work completely differently. That's a nice thing. So... I, I learned that, you know, me, I like the, the beautiful. I tried to show you all this great science of all the encapsulation, tried to explain it to you. Do you think that matters a bit when you're making makeup? No, it doesn't. <laughs> Sorry, the science makes no difference. You have to sell people by the dream, of the dream. But it really does make a difference. So you can do things that are completely different. 
And that's what capsule movie is done. <laughs> okay. Let me let me give you some economics, okay? This is an interesting question. I said they sold a million units, right? Hundred dollars a unit. Hundred million, right? Let's go through the economics of that. Hundred dollars a unit. Fifty dollars goes to the store that sells it. Forty-five dollars goes to Chanel. Five dollars goes to Capsule. They still make money. Okay, you can see where the real. You can see why why uh, you know Chanel. It's, it's the advertising, right? It's making people feel good. But you still make money. More economics. The amount that Chanel spent to introduce that product, to introduce that one product, was more than they spent to buy capsule. 